Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. Um, inter- this is going to be an interesting day. They're going to be firing off uh, the big money cannon later today. Um, to say this is a lot of money is putting it mildly. I think we're now up to what, five, five and a half trillion dollars. New poll out from Pew suggesting that 70% of Americans actually favor this, which uh, is, is kind of remarkable, shows how the politics of spending have changed. I think the most remarkable finding was that 41% of Republicans and Republican-leaning independents also uh, like the bill. Uh, President Biden will be speaking to the nation tomorrow night. A quick reminder that we have the Bulwark live stream every Thursday night. We're going to be doing that again at 8 o'clock Eastern time, and the whole crew is going to be there. So if you're a Bulwark Plus member, uh, you will be able to access that. If you're not yet a Bulwark Plus member, you have, well, I'm giving you like uh, two days uh, heads up. So uh, our guest today is David Shore who is a, an election data analyst. And let me just give you a little bit of background because you, you've, you've heard of David Shore, but I want to put this in context. And this is the way he was described in New York Magazine back in July. David Shore got famous by getting fired. In late May, amid widespread protests over George Floyd's murder, the 28-year-old data scientist tweeted out a study that found nonviolent demonstrations were more effective than riots, quote unquote riots, at pushing public opinion and voter behavior leftward in 1968. Many Twitter users and reportedly some of Shore's colleagues and clients at the data firm Civis Analytics found this post insensitive. A day later, Shore publicly apologized for his tweet. Two weeks after that, he had lost his job as Civis's head of pub- political data science and became a byword for the excesses of so called cancel culture. Uh, but before Shore's improbable transformation into a cause celeb, he was among the most influential data gurus in Democratic politics, a whiz kid who, at the age of 20, served as the 2012 Obama campaign's in-house Nate Silver, authoring the forecasting model that the White House used to determine where the race really stood. So David Shore has because was not canceled, as it turns out, and has continued to be a data guru analyzing and performing autopsies on the 2020 election. And he joins us on today's Bulwark podcast. So good morning, David. How are you? I'm great. Such a pleasure to be here. So tell me what you're doing. I asked you before this, but tell me what you're doing right now. Uh, I'm the head of data science at Open Labs, a progressive nonprofit uh, at, that's focused on you know providing polling and public goods to the progressive cause. We are hiring. Uh, if anyone wants to go to my Twitter and see the job postings we have up. So tell me, what was it that got you know? Look, looking back on you getting fired, I, I mean, look, I, I'm, I, 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 I try to stay out of the the wokest of the woke precincts, but you were pushing out data saying that riots weren't good for Democrats, that when there were riots, people tended to move right. That seems prescriptive. And why do you think that that was seen perceived to be insensitive or a fireable offense in retrospect? Well, you know, I don't want to comment too much on all of that. But I will say, you know, obviously, it was a very sensitive uh, moment uh, and uh, a very powerful moment. People had a lot of feelings. Um, but I do think it is an important message and one that's been around, you know, for, for decades that nonviolent protest is very effective at moving uh, moving opinion and making people embrace the cause of egalitarianism. And, you know, something that's uh, really hard uh, about when you depart from nonviolent protests is, you know, fundamentally, the core mission of the left is to get people to support uh, egalitarian causes. And, you know, we've seen in a lot of research and the tweet that I put out was uh, just one example, that when uh, when violence starts to happen, when there's crime, that's like very corrosive. You know, people stop be, stop being receptive to this message of uh, wanting to help other people and instead kind of turn toward wanting to protect themselves. And that's something that's been, you know, toxic to center left causes, you know, uh, now and really uh, across across the last 200 years across the world. And this turned out to be a major factor in the 2020 election. So I want to turn to your your updated um, autopsy on the election. And, you know, there's obviously a a, a lot of different takes from all of this. But 
I found your discussion of what happened with Hispanic voters to be the most interesting. This was one of the most unexpected developments, I think, for a lot of folks. The fact that uh, Democrats uh, lost ground among Hispanics, that Hispanics swung toward Trump by about eight or nine percentage points. And this was this was pretty much across the country. So let's talk about that. What what exactly were the main factors to, to explain the decline in Hispanic support for Democrats? You know, I think the important way to start this conversation, to ground it, is to talk about ideology. Uh, mm -hmm. If you ask people, uh, do you identify as moderate, liberal, or conservative, uh, there aren't very large racial differences. You know, obviously there are very large racial differences in partisanship in terms of who people vote for, but roughly the same proportion of white, black, and Hispanic voters ident identify as liberal, moderate, and conservative. And among white voters, there's this strong ideological polarization where, you know, 90% of white liberals vote for Democrats and something like 80% of white conservatives vote for Republicans. But among non-white voters, historically, Democrats have won uh, non-white conservatives and actually actually won them by very large margins. And, you know, the big picture story of the last four years has been that there's been an ideological polarization among non-white voters so that non-white conservatives are starting to vote more like white conservatives. And, you know, this has been a trend that's happened through the last four years. I think people didn't, one of the underappreciated trends of 2018 was that non-white voters trended against the Democratic Party while white voters trended toward it. This was really electorally important. You know, Democrats lost uh, the Georgia governor's race because Stacey Abrams did worse among black voters than Hillary Clinton did. And the same is true for the Florida Senate race um, in uh in 2018 as well. And so there were a lot of close races that we ended up losing because of this because of this trend. But zooming to the last two years, you know, even though there's this broader trend, um, there's always going to be specific triggers. You know, we something that we I, I think comes out very clearly in both the precinct election results and in polling that we've done since the election uh, points to two specific factors. You know, the first is among even though there was a you know, a decline in a large decline in the Hispanic vote basically everywhere in the country, it was particularly pronounced in places with large amounts of Colombian and Venezuelan uh, ancestry. Mm -hmm. You know, one example uh, that I bring up in my interview is Doral, which is actually very close to where I went to college in FIU, uh, which is has one of the highest proportions of Venezuelan and Colombian ancestry in the country. It's a precinct that went that Clinton won by 40 points and that Trump won by 10 points. This is, in, uh, this is South, South Florida. I just want to clarify. This is, this, in South this is, Florida. Yeah. That's right. It's in South Florida. Yeah. And, yeah. And I think it tells, uh, I think this discrepancy uh, tells a very powerful story uh, in that uh, so social, if you actually look at polling and attitudes towards socialism, uh, Venezuelans and, you know, Colombians have, I think, particularly, are particularly hostile to the label, you know, partly, uh, I, th I think probably because the historical context of what socialism means to them is FARC paramilitaries or Maduro and less uh, Sweden, you know, which is how a lot of white liberal voters uh, think of socialism. I think the second big thing, you know, that comes out uh, is that we did a large post-election survey of Hispanic voters after the election, and we asked a battery of different questions, you know, attitudes toward lockdown, you know, uh, towards crime, toward, uh, you know, re uh, re uh, reproductive choice. And something that came out really clearly is that one of the strong, like, actually the strongest predictor of switching from uh, Clinton, Clinton to Trump was attitudes on crime and attitudes toward public safety. Interesting. Mm hmm and no the blind. last thing I'll, and the last thing I'll say here is I think kind of contrary to a lot of the public uh, public discussion around this Hispanic women trended more than Hispanic men you know people like to talk about machismo um, but we saw that the swing among women was roughly twice as large as the swing among men and I think that makes a lot of sense in the context of uh, of you know defund the police and crime in that women care in polling women place a higher uh, premium on keeping crime low and on public safety I think for you know a lot of a lot of a lot of reasons and uh, so I, I think this points to a clear picture that the 2018 to 2020 de decline did have a lot to do with the rising salience of socialism and the rising salience of defund the police. But I want to say, you know, we shouldn't focus too much on those two things because I think there's a broader story here, which is that over the last four years, 
uh, white liberals have become an increasingly dominant part of the Democratic coalition to an extent to which wasn't true 20 years ago. And they've really remade the party in their image, uh, a very in, ter- in terms of making it a very ideological party that communicates in ideological terms. And as that happens, you know, that's not just going to turn off working class white voters. It's also going to turn off t- turn off working class non-white voters who actually uh, many of most of whom uh, identify as moderate or conservative. This is this is really interesting to me because there there were a lot of people on the left who I think thought that 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 as the party became more dominated by white college educated voters, that somehow it would pull the party toward the right. And the point that you are making is that, in fact, the opposite is happening, is that this cohort is, in fact, taking the party further to the left and making it more ideological, which is alienating some of these non-white voters, which I'm thinking of the pundit punditry that I read through 2020. I don't think people saw that coming. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I think one of my biggest, you know, I think mistakes of the last five years is, you know, five years ago, I saw this trend of uh, educated, uh, richer white voters entering the Democratic Party and working class white voters leaving the Democratic Party. And I, like a lot of other people, particularly on the left, really assumed that this would end up pushing the party to be kind of socially liberal and fiscally moderate. But that has not happened. You know, as the Democratic Party has become more educated, um, it has become uh, more liberal and more left wing on both social and economic issues. And I think it's a really interesting question as to why I think we've seen similar trends, um, you know, in other countries uh, in the West. Uh, it's They have different electoral systems, and so it's manifested in different ways. But I think it's definitely a clear trend. And I think the big reason is that uh, educated people uh, have much more ideologically coherent views. And I don't mean that in a good way. Uh, I think in a lot of ways, ideologically coherent means what educated people have to believe. And so as educated people have entered the Democratic Party, uh, the Democratic Party has become more ideologically coherent um, in how it communicates and and in terms of policy, while the Republican Party has become less ideologically coherent. And Donald Trump is a is a great example of that. You know, he he was actually rated as, you know, one of the in 2016 as one of the most moderate people to run for president. If you look at, you know, the ANES and how survey takers rated mm-hmm. folks. And I think the big reason is that he kind of uh, rejected this conservative this conservative idea that uh, you should simultaneously that of entitlement cuts. He said he wasn't going to cut Social Security. He wasn't going to cut Medicare and that he wanted to cut immigration. This is a view that the median voter held, but it was a view that's very unpopular among both educated Republicans and educated Democrats. And, you know, one of the reasons he was able to cut through was because he managed to kind of reject this ideological orthodoxy, even if he did it in a way that I don't like. Um, And Democrats have instead moved in the opposite direction. They've become a lot less willing to uh, to kind of adopt a uh, an ideologically incoherent agenda in order to win votes. Uh, And, you know, the consequence of that Hmm. is that they've started winning fewer votes. So you 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 have a line in in your uh, in your interview, which I thought was interesting. You said that that ideological polarization is a dead end that and this is on the theme you're describing that from the point of view of Democrats, ideological polarization is not a winning formula. So could you, I think you've been expanding on that. But could you expand on that a little bit more? Sure. So, you know, fundamentally, 20 percent of the country identifies as liberal, 40 percent of the country identifies as conservative and 40 percent of the country identifies as moderate. A lot of people like to claim that these ideological labels don't mean anything, um, but they do um, across a variety of issues, particularly relating to you know racial resentment. But across others, liberals have very different views than the rest of the country. Uh, one phrase that I hear people say a lot is they say, you know, Democrats were too wonky. We talk too much about issues and we don't talk enough about our values. And the problem is that, you know, swing voters don't share our values. If they did, they wouldn't be swing voters. They would be Democrats. Uh, and uh, and so because, you know, we actually uh, the values of highly educated, uh, you know, urban white people are actually very alien to the median voter who's a 50 year old with a college degree. And uh, the only reason why store- don't, don't go to pass that too quickly here. Um, what, why are the, the values, uh, so what, what, is, what explains the, the, the gap? How, how are yeah. they alien? 
You know, I, I think it's, it's, a great, uh, it's a great question. When you look at the swing from 2012 to 2016, um, education tells most of the story that college-educated white voters swung toward Democrats and non-college-educated white people swung toward Republicans. And, you know, but it wasn't education. It's not actually education that drives, you know, this split. You know, and we've gone and we've done surveys. There are a lot of fundamental differences in terms of attitudes toward racial resentment. Uh, attitudes towards social trust. College-educated voters are substantially more likely to say that people can be trusted. Uh, and it also just shows up in terms of personality. You know, uh, if you look at openness to new experiences, which is kind of uh, something that psychologists like to use to describe uh, personality, uh, liberals uh, liberals are much more open. You know, when they see new novel stimuli, when a new ethnic restaurant opens in their, rest- in their neighborhood, they get really excited. They like to live in denser places. And, uh, you know, working class voters are much lower. Uh, and openness to new experiences. They hmm. don't react positively to novel stimuli. And so this just kind of gets at this really fundamental divide in terms of you know values, in terms of what kind of society they want to live in. And if young, highly educated liberals make the Democratic Party a mouthpiece for their preferred way of life, they're going to really turn off a lot of people um, because the median voter, again, is a 50-year-old without a college degree. And so we should really make, if, if you have an agenda centered on giving people health care, on making it easier to go to college, on giving people jobs, that's something that, you know, a working class 50 year old can get behind. But if you're instead, you know, trying to project that we want to turn America into Brooklyn, uh, then it's going to be much harder to build a coalition that gets to 50. Or, and so, again, this is actually the key point, is getting to 50 isn't enough due to the nature of our electoral system. We need to get to 52 in order to win the presidency. And we need, honestly, 53 or 54 in order to win the kind of states we need to maintain our Senate majority. Uh, and so that's why I said it's a dead end. So what you're describing and putting it in a slightly different way is that if Democrats stick to bread and butter economics, jobs, economic issues, they will score points with these voters if they double down on wokeness um, and cultural issues, they will alienate those voters. Yeah, something I want to make clear is that uh, there are a variety of non-economic issues that are actually, you know, popular. Uh, I, we won the North Carolina Senate race in 2016 because Republic because of the Republicans tried to pass a trans bathroom bill. So I think you know the median voter, even though they're not as racially liberal as um, as liberals, still are broadly okay with inclusiveness and uh, things like police reform. But it's really important to communicate around these things in a way that uh, is palatable to people who identify as conservative. And that's Mm -hmm. something that I think Joe Biden has done very well. Um, I think it's something that historically Democrats did well throughout the 90s and the 2000s. But, you know, I think the key thing here is that uh, liberals and I think people who write about politics in progressive space all really want radical change. And the way that you get attention is to cast things in the most radical light possible. You know, I, I, my, one of my friends calls it acid coating. And that's really bad. You know, uh, I, people don't actually want radical change. We have a Republican governor in Vermont and a Democratic governor in Kansas because you had uh, these strongly ideological governors who tried to pass, uh, you know, pretty uh, really expansive, unpopular legislation. And the end result is that they lost. And so that doesn't personally, you know, I'm, I'm a left wing guy and I, I support, you know, radical change. But we really need to communicate in ways that won't turn people off and present things as common sense solutions um, rather than trying to give the image that we're trying to fundamentally transform society. Well, let's talk about racism, because you had some very interesting thoughts about that. I'm going to read you what you said in the New York interview. In liberal circles, racism has been defined in highly ideological terms, and this theoretical perspective on what racism means and the nature of racial inequality has become a big part of the group identity of college-educated Democrats, white and non-white, but it is not necessarily how most non-white working-class people understand racism. So talk about that gap and and the and, and, and the way that Democrats need to talk about race and not talk about race. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't feel super comfortable talking about this at length since, you know, I, I am white. Um, but I, I do think something that shows up very clearly in polling is that uh, there are a lot when you look at uh, 
ac what academics call, you know, uh, racial resentment indexes, you know, questions like, do you believe that the reason that African Americans can't get ahead is due to discrimination? Um, at this point, and this has only been true since 2014, when there was uh, in the uh, white liberals are now more likely to say that discrimination is the reason why African Americans can't get ahead than African Americans, which is um, strange. Uh, I, and I think it does hint a little bit at, you know, what these things are measuring. And so, you know, I, I think that the most important thing to me is uh, that we should be, you know, we are lucky enough to have uh, a large, ca a large cast of elected black officials who legitimately, who have legitimate democratic representation of the black community. And, you know, that's true for Hispanics as well. And to the extent to which we listen to them and have our uh, anti-racism agenda be driven by them, uh, it's going to go over a lot better, both in terms of like outcomes and also in terms of politics than if we let uh, largely white leftists in Brooklyn kind of determine the uh, political agenda. I want to go back to the point you made about crime and the way the crime played, uh, you know, played during the the election. Um, there were a lot of folks who I, I think thought that the law and order uh, campaign that that, that uh, Republicans were running, that Trump was running, uh, was not succeeding. And and you know, I was one of those who was raising their hand, saying, you know, here in Wisconsin, um, it is playing differently, particularly maybe not in the suburban areas, but you know, in small towns. I hadn't seen the fact that it was going to uh, also erode the non-white vote. But but you did point out, and, and I think it's just, I just want to make sure we, we, we emphasize this, is that when you went back and you looked at voters who switched from supporting Hillary Clinton in 2016 to Donald Trump in 2020, which is mind boggling to me. But what you found was the Clinton voters with conservative views on crime, policing and public safety were far more likely to switch to Trump than voters with less conservative views on those issues. And having conservative views on those issues was more predictive of switching from Clinton to Trump than having conservative views on any other issue set. That I thought was very interesting. How powerful, how salient that issue of policing and crime was in motivating those voters. So th this really is is a very specific manifestation of what you've been you've been describing. Yeah, that's absolutely right. You know, I, I think that really going throughout history, both here and everywhere in the world, you know, crime is very corrosive uh, to the center left project of egalitarianism. You know, what we really want you know, on the left is to promote solidarity, uh, to promote this idea that we should care about other people. And when crime goes up, uh, that really makes people afraid. It makes people pivot to trying to create law and order. And that's one of the key strengths uh, of the right. Uh, you know, when people look, uh, when you look at issues that people trust different parties on, people trust the center left on, you know, health care, on reducing poverty, on looking out for the middle class. Uh, but they trust the right uh, on key, on lowering crime and issues like immigration, and our job, you know, as as people as you know, m members of the center left, is that we want to do everything we can to increase the salience of the things that voters trust us on, which is healthcare and bread and butter issues. And we really want to do everything we can to keep the things that people trust the right on, uh, you know, things like crime and things like immigration, out of the public conversation. And that doesn't mean, you know, that we can't pass bills and do things. Um, but it means that uh, we want to do everything we can to, one, have people not be thinking about crime. And one of the easiest ways to do that is to make sure that crime is low. And two, to not create this perception that Democrats don't care about crime, because that's an incredibly toxic uh, toxic position to hold. People care a lot about you know the public safety and their own safety and the safety of their families. And if we look like we don't care about that, that's going to make, that's, that's a really deep a uh, deep issue that will turn people off. So let's talk about immigration. We talked about crime, but but immigration, um, you mentioned that several times. Um, obviously, Joe Biden is, is pursuing a radically different pos uh, approach than than Donald Trump. Um, we are seeing some problems at the border beginning to gel with a number of unaccompanied minors. Um, the, the numbers, you know, pu public opinion seems to favor uh, you, know, you know some of the immigration reform ideas of creating a path to citizenship, but but you're saying that you know th this would be a mistake for Democrats to make this a priority. I 
there, our current immigration system is a humanitarian crisis. And I, I do believe, you know, as a liberal, that Democrats should use their power to try to alleviate that. But I think that there's a really big distinction um, between what you run on and uh, what you do uh, and what you talk about. Uh, you know, one of my favorite examples for this is that, you know, Donald Trump uh, did a lot to make it easier to pollute rivers and to uh, and he did a lot to uh, push a very unpopular deregulatory agenda, but he didn't talk about it. Um, I think it's really unfortunate that the median voter sees uh, accepting more refugees as like roughly as toxic as uh, as making it easier to put toxic chemicals in the air. Um, but I, that is the political reality we live in, that the median voter is actually very skeptical of a lot of liberal ideas on immigration. And that means that doesn't mean that we shouldn't do things um, to address this humanitarian crisis. I, I believe we should. But it means that we shouldn't, shouldn't talk about it very much. Uh, and we should do everything we can mm. to keep it off of the public agenda in the same way that Republicans, I think, are very smart. You know, They don't go out and campaign on the fact that they cut taxes for very rich people. Uh, and the same, you know, they, they, they focus on their good cards. And, you know, I think that we should focus. The point of public facing communication is to persuade people. And we should focus our public facing communication on the issues that people agree with us on and the issues that people care about. Yeah, th- th- that obviously explains why the Obama administration over eight years didn't really pursue or make a priority of, of immigration reform. I assume that that's a uh, that, that, that's part of the explanation. So let's talk about what's happening today. Um, we, we're having the House of Representatives will be voting on this massive $1.9 trillion uh, COVID relief package, which is which is really a BFD. I mean, it's, you know, the, the, the more you find out about it, I mean, the more um, the more that is is in it. Uh, the Biden folks are going to be selling this aggressively. They think that they learned from the failures of the Obama administration to aggressively sell this. So the president's going to make a speech. Um, just listening to the way you were laying out the, the issue, uh, you know, the, the, the issue buffet. Um, how does this play? It, this seems more responsive to the kind of agenda that, that you have been advocating because it, it is addressing issues of jobs and putting cash in people's pocket, uh, job training, uh, family support, uh, the, the children's tax credit. So talk to me about how you politically this plays out in this in this universe of ideological polarization. It's a great question. We've, over the last couple months, pulled something like 60 or 70 different issues as, you know, part of the services that, you know, we try to provide to folks in the party. And the American Recovery Act is uh, literally the most popular uh, thing that we've pulled, even uh, even with pro and con arguments, even with Republican attacks. It is a very popular bill and the pieces of it are very popular. Uh, and I, I think that, that it's a good example of focusing on uh, economic issues that people care about. And you know, to the extent to which the media covers this, as opposed to the media covering the return of Donald Trump or all of the different things that Republicans do, uh, it'll play very well for Democrats. But it does highlight kind of the core challenge. You know, Chuck Schumer is out there every single day talking about gas prices or health care, but the media doesn't cover it. Uh, and in order, this is one of the core challenges, is that uh, Democrats can talk about bread and butter issues all the time, but if they slip up even once or twice, you know, that's what the media will tend to cover. And uh, that, that's one of the you know, core challenges of this. But the last thing I'll say is that, you know, Joe Biden's approval rating has been pretty steady since inauguration. As far as I can tell, it hasn't really dropped at all. And that's amazing. As far as I can tell, that's literally never happened, you know, in the history of public opinion polling. Normally, presidential approval drops like a stone over the first couple of months. It happened to Obama. It happened to Trump. It happened to basically every uh, every uh, elected president since FDR. And uh, I think that the fact that he's focused his agenda on uh, such a popular bill that has such popular parts, I think, plays a big part as to why. What makes it so popular? Just that people want to have uh, free money in their pockets or, or is there something else that's, that's driving the, the popularity of the legislation? I, I think that uh, every single piece of it, expanding the child tax credit, uh, get putting money, putting checks in people's pockets, like every constituent part is very popular. Some of that is the moment. I think generally uh, at this exact moment, the public is much more open to, uh, you know, large large spending than I think they would have been at any point. And we've seen that in polling. Um, but I think the key is that 
there isn't really any unpopular component of it that uh, Republicans can, you know, uh, hang their hat on. Uh, and that's the thing that's made it go well. I think one of the really sad things about politics is that uh, you're kind of judged on the most unpopular part of your bill because that's what the media yeah. ends up talking about. And this bill doesn't have anything in it that is unpopular. And that's required a lot of discipline, I think, on the part of the Biden administration and, you know, Chuck Schumer. Uh, but it's something that I think is paid dividends because as we can, you know, it's had really large effects on the polling. Well, the one negative I, I would be, and I don't don't see a huge uh, number of people who are concerned about this, is the is the level of debt and deficit. You know that you're talking about now five trillion dollars basically put on the credit card, which used to be controversial. But I think you're right. I mean, I think that public opinion has shifted, and after four years of Trump, fiscal conservatism has been beaten to death with with hammers. Uh, one of the questions I have, though, is that at what point will the Democrats have to talk about revenue enhancements? You you pointed out that the Republicans never talk about their, their massive tax cut anymore, which, by the way, they thought was their signature issue. They thought this was the popular issue, and they decided it's not. But at some point, aren't Democrats going to have to say, hey, we have to pay for this stuff? Do, are, we, are we going to repeal these tax cuts? And how does that play? That's a great it's a great question. You know, generally tax increases are usually uh, are usually unpopular. The reality is that the kind of popular tax tax increases, you know, raising taxes on the rich are just not doesn't can't raise that much revenue uh, in scope. Uh, I think the big question is what are the remaining bills the Democrats are going to try to do and how much revenue they're going to they're going to need for it. And I don't know. I mean, I'm not a legislative expert, uh, but it will. I think the big question is that right now the public mood and kind of the broader set of elites is like very in favor of deficit spending. And uh, if that changes, uh, like we saw in 2009 or at various points in the past, then suddenly Democrats will be under a lot of public pressure. But, you know, personally, I'm hoping that this elite consensus stays. So at the very end of your 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 most recent interview with New York Magazine, you have some sort of dark warnings here. You said you think the Trump era, this is a little bit contrarian, too, because in a lot of the, the commentary that you hear is how Trump is wrecking the Republican Party or destroying the Republican Party. You argue that the Trump era has, in fact, been very good for the Republican Party, even if they now momentarily have to accept the very, very, very thin, three varies, thin uh, Democratic trifecta, because if these coalition changes are durable, the GOP has a very rosy long-term prospect for dominating America's federal institutions. So what 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 needs to happen? So you 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 obviously are in the business of advising Democrats, you know, given the structural advantages that Republicans have, given some of these these changes, what do they need to do? And and you do talk about some of the structural issues, adding states uh, changing, uh, gerrymandering laws. Um, because if they don't, you're basically saying that if you don't add states, if you don't ban partisan redistricting, um, if you don't elevate issues that appeal to lots of working class conservatives, uh, things could get very bleak, very fast. So are you pessimistic, optimistic, hopeful, panicky? What? Uh, cautious, <laughs> cautious, cautiously pessimistic. I, I'll just talk a little bit. I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about numbers. Um, you know, in twenty in twenty sixteen in twenty twelve, uh, Barack Obama got fifty two percent of the two party vote uh, mm -hmm. for, for the presidency, and in twenty sixteen, Hillary Clinton got fifty one point one percent. That in any other country would have been enough uh, for Democrats to hold power. Uh, but what happened at the same time is that the Electoral College went from being about one point biased toward Democrats uh, to being like three points biased in favor of Republicans. Uh, and that's why we lost. Basically, this shift of non-college educated white voters toward the Republican Party increased the bias of our, of our, of our electoral institutions because non-college educated whites are disproportionately live in rural areas and rural areas are overrepresented in our electoral system in a bunch of ways, whether it's in the electoral college because there's a bunch of large Midwestern states or in the Senate because the Senate obviously um, by design overweights um, rural, rural states. And so in 2020, that bias increased. You know, in 2016, we could have won with 51.6% of the two-party vote. And in 2020, we needed 52%. And luckily, we got 52.3 and we narrowly won. Um, but as long as this education polarization continues, as long as college-educated voters 
trend left and college educated Republic and non-college edu- uh, whites trend right, this is going to make it harder for Democrats to win elections and increase the amount of the vote we need in order to maintain power. Uh, and I think that there's two tacks, you know, as you talked about in your introduction, you know, the first is that midterms are usually fairly bad. Hopefully this will be better than average, but our current electoral house map is heavily gerrymandered. The median uh, seat that decides control of Congress is about three points to the right of the country overall. And so that means that if we get 50% of the vote or 51% of the vote in 2022, we will almost certainly lose the House and potentially lose the Senate. So uh, there are uh, there are structural reforms that our current Congress can pass. We can have D.C. and Puerto Rican statehood. We can get rid of uh, partisan gerrymandering. And that would substantially increase our chance of holding power. But more than that, um, we really need to reverse this education polarization uh, and decrease the biases of our institutions, um, because otherwise uh, we'll just constantly need to get 52 or 53 or even 54 percent of the vote in order for us to maintain power. And that's not tenable in the long run. We managed to scrape 52.3 percent running against one of the most unpopular Republicans to ever run for office. And that was only barely enough, even though we nominated the most popular person in our party, whose surname is in Obama. And so uh, I think that really speaks to the urgency of doing that, of, uh, of, tr- of, of trying to appeal more to working class uh, white voters. Uh, and I think it also speaks to the urgency that we really, really need to pass these structural reforms um, in, in, in order for us to not be caught uh, flat footed like we were in 2011. OK, so t- tomorrow morning after this podcast has been posted to your phone rings and it's, uh, it's and it's the president sitting in the Oval Office saying that he'd been listening to you on this podcast and, and he wants three ideas from you how to end this educational polarization and appeal to these working class voters, white and non-white. What, what would the three things you would tell the president? I don't know about three, but I think a really <laughs> underrated, I, I think a really underrated uh, key to winning elections is to run on popular issues that people care about. <laughs> and I think so far, so it's, it's become a, uh, an ancient, uh, rediscovering an ancient wisdom. Uh, and so I think that. Uh, it's funny to hear you say that because it's so, it's so obvious, but, but, but this is the problem of, only, of ideological polarization, right? That people want to scratch their itches as opposed to, hey guys, maybe talk about the things that people like as opposed to the things that make you feel good about yourself? Yeah, I think it comes back to this idea that the purpose of public facing communication is to persuade people. That's the reason why we're doing it. And I think that, you know, it's a simple idea, but I think it's very radical in its implications. Right now, most progressive organizations use the media as a means to talk to each other and coordinate yeah. with each other. And the problem is that swing voters are listening. Uh, and so I think we really need message discipline. We need to internally coordinate and we need to put out uh, we need to put out messaging that builds a brand that isn't toxic to working class voters. And I think this is a totally doable thing. This is something that Barack Obama did. Education polarization actually decreased um, under in, in both 2008 and 2012. Uh, and so it's not it's it's not a force of uh, it's not a force of nature. This is totally in our power and it's totally something we can do. We just have to be more like more like Barack Obama. David Shore, thank you so much for joining me uh, today on the podcast. Fascinating stuff. Uh, And I really really appreciate it. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. And thank you all for listening to today's Bulwark podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. We will be back tomorrow, and we will do this all over again.